We now welcome architect Professor Indrika Rajpaksha, who presented her ideas under the topic Equity in Urban Health, where she states that in low- and middle-income countries, health can be considered as the pulse of the new urban agenda. Architect Naratna, if you can. Um, okay, so... Uh, uh, Professor Indrika, uh, yes, uh, it's, it's very interesting and timely what you're uh, dealing with, but I know uh, that your research uh, was not started just because COVID, because uh, say I know for a fact that you started on this area a long time ago and, and actually which uh, culminated with this, uh, this thing, but uh, but uh, say your research is on uh, these um, area is very, very important. And it's, I think it is very, uh, say this time people would have understood the gravity of what you are talking. Uh, now, uh, there, there are two questions that I would like to raise into you because you have in this research and maybe you have an idea of how do we bring the thoughts that you were talking and the uh, best practices or things like that, how do you bring into the policy and which area of policy is it onto uh, medical, health, welfare or environment or combination of them in, in terms of policy? Uh, number two, uh, how do you bring that into the, uh, into the planning or physical planning policy, what do you think, uh, what are the ways in which that within the context that we could do or we might have to do, uh, change the context of our systems to, to achieve this? Answer your question. Can you hear? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, I have explained in detail in my presentation. Uh, so uh, when looking at the health, I would like to start answering this uh, question by focusing on the latest concerns of WHO that the health is beyond the medical professionals. It has social determinants as well as it has environmental determinants. So that means every time when we design a building, do we consider health is important as professionals? So building would be the module which expands towards to the magnitude of bringing neighborhoods and cities. So health is, when we start thinking, it, we are into siloed approach. We think building only as a building, but we don't think building is connected to people. It is a place, but it is connected with processes. So when you look at the policies in this country. Housing policy is something individual. Energy policy is something individual. Urban policies are individual. So we have not thought of an integrated approach. So I would like, through the research, to present two examples. Look at the schools of this country. Where are they positioned? Take all the schools in the city of Colombo, all are positioned facing to high traffic roads. What is a road? Look at the advertisement of apartments in this country. Accessibility. And also another important thing I would like to just to bring a sort of food for thought P-O-R-S of UDA guideline. What is P-O-R-S? Public Open Recreational Spaces Standard. What has it highlighted? It says if you want to have an urban park or any recreational space in a city, accessibility is the priority. Why all the parks in this country facing traffic roads, highly polluted roads. And with that intention in mind, I took a research 
combined with medical faculty, we were monitoring particles emitted from these vehicles and the amount of pollution gets into the lungs of people. Question about the park design. All the walking tracks of these parks are positioned closer to the roads. That is where you inhale high volume of air. A day, a person you uh, get with its inhale 11,000 liters of air. That is six to 7,000 more than the amount you intake in terms of food or water. So when you inhale more pollutions, and this traffic pollution is with ultra-fine particles, your natural systems cannot stop. And this study, we found the places where in the park, which is very much cleaner for the people to inhale, not a single person in that area. So this is just a basic finding, a fundamental, to think of. So what I would like to express here is that it is very important that we get into integrated approach where all our policies have to think of. And the amount of energy consumed in air-conditioned building makes the atmosphere heated up. So the person who is wealthy is in a comfortable cooling environment, at the same time heating. The places where the urban poor are, they are into heat strokes. Because they do not have, that is called energy poverty. Because they don't have enough money, or they will not switch on even a fan to make themselves cool. So this is the disparity between society. So the health is not that the poor people, we make them sick. So therefore, we have to think. So my main focus is that we need to go for siloed approaches, away from siloed approaches towards integrated policies. I hope I have answered, Nawa. Uh, yeah, um, thanks. I think, um, say, that is where I wanted to direct you also, because, uh, say, one of the conclusions that we have to look at today is how do we get into these integrated answers? integrated answers in terms of uh, spatial planning um, and in that, of course, health is becoming, or as you said, it's going uh, not only with the medical professionals but the other professionals. Concerns are also important in this uh, context of space planning uh, as an integrated approach. So um, thank you, uh, Professor Indrika. Uh, let's... Uh, get on with the next uh, Dr. Pendra. Thank you, Professor. Next, we welcome architect Dr. Upendra Rajapaksha, who presented the topic, Redefining Quality of Life, Urban Form, Climate and Energy, where he states that new currency to measure quality of life could be a system thinking to redefine quality of life, urban form, climate and energy. Architect Naratna, you can proceed. Um, Okay, thank you. Um, so I think uh, there are uh, uh, two things that I was uh, very interested uh, in what you are uh, talking, Dr. Upendra. Uh, number one is that you are seeing a new currency measure, uh, that is, uh, say, to measure the quality of life, um, which is very good because, uh, say, we were in the beginning of this, we have been discussing, uh, I think we'll have to look at our value system change. So if our value system changes, it is not the monetary rupees and cents that we are looking at. It is, uh, say, we have to look at another measure. So um, that, is, um, that is a system that you uh, propose. And uh, then uh, quality of life and a system thinking is, is what you are proposing. Uh, rather than asking you a question, uh, can you brief uh, again and uh, to this audience um, what your thoughts and what your uh, thoughts beyond this uh, and implementation uh, 
sort of uh, what are the ways in which that we could implement uh, and how do we bring these things into a national policy and a physical planning policy. Yes, uh, thank you, Nawa. Um, in, uh, I'm happy to hear uh, some of the key words uh, today uh, from uh, some of the speakers, uh, like uh, new urban society, and then uh, we heard uh, environmental protection, natural system, revolution, cyclic economy, cyclic process. These are very unique uh, components of sustainable development approach. So I think uh, this is how you know we can integrate all these concerns. Uh, concerns in uh, promoting a new quality of life. Currently, at present, uh, most of us think that uh, you know quality of life is something to do with luxurious uh, facilities that we have. But uh, in the system, new system thinking in any activity, uh, the quality of life uh, should be framed around the, the impact that uh, your activities uh, create on the nature. The, if you take one simple example, uh, a building can create uh, different levels of impacts on the nature. For example, uh, due to a building, um, you know, you need uh, some sort of resources to produce and construct the building, and then after producing the building for its operation, you need uh, simply energy. So use of energy creates uh, uh, some uh, negative impacts to the environment like uh, carbon emission because uh, to produce energy, you need to burn fossil fuels and that's the major disaster or uh, global issue currently we are facing. So within that framework, we need to integrate all these thinking all this thinking in the social aspects, all thinking in, in terms of or in the context of uh, economic development and then contextualizing or localizing your, our solutions. We need to think everything in a one framework which is mainly, we should mainly focus on ecocentric approach. That's why, that's why I made my presentation, uh, system thinking with the ecocentric approach. So in that, now how do, the question is how do we uh, implement this uh, ecocentric approach in an urban environment? It's, uh, if you take uh, current situation in any urban areas, for example in Sri Lanka, um, we don't see any uh, kind of uh, sustainable approach because uh, the, 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 the systems that, integrate, that has been integrated in urban areas are totally depend on, on uh, artificial uh, uh, activities or they are not independent and they create many problems like uh, uh, the, the pollution, the energy, energy consumption and therefore its impact on the nature. So we need to think of uh, uh, simply uh, an urban system with uh, independent units or independent clusters or independent compact forms. And each independent compact precinct can have most of the activities, most of the activities related to housing, commercial, office, schools, etc., etc. So this, the, in this cluster form, these precincts can function independently, but they are important components of a larger system. So we need to uh, uh, think of uh, implementing uh, a more sustainable approach to, into this um, system thinking consists of uh, clusters of mere various built forms, various built uh, 
uh, entities and various functions, etc. So in this approach, even in case of a disaster, uh, something like um, disaster uh, of any, any, any kind of disaster, uh, one entity can function um, without depending on a larger system. So I think this uh, thinking can be integrated uh, very easily in, um, in the implementation of planning and uh, urban design uh, initiatives. Thank you. Uh, say, I think, um, yeah, uh, that is uh, compact self-defense clusters that you are uh, talking of uh, is uh, one of the things that we could uh, take out for uh, our summary because that's what um, Dr. Upendra is trying to promote. Let's get in with uh, Professor Bal Surya's presentation. Thank you, Doctor. Our next panelist, architect Professor Lal Balasurya, is a past president of the SLIA and is the current head of the City School of Architecture, Colombo Limited. He presented insight on the topic, dependency of cities in rural sector, where he highlights the need to strengthen the interdependence of rural with the urban and calls for a suitable arrangement for the city to give back to the rural and questions, what does the city give back to the rural when receiving the produce? Um, <clears throat> yeah, Professor, uh, it was um, interesting listening to your presentation and uh, <coughs> new thoughts. And I, I felt that the, it links what you are talking, links uh, very much with what uh, Dr. Lochan was talking about, is uh, say spreading it into the towns and then getting infrastructure. And you are adding something to it in your speech which uh, interested me was um, value addition at the point of production, uh, which, is, uh, which is a very important phenomenon. If, uh, if uh, what we are saying is uh, bringing it into the township or, or stopping them at that point with certain social uh, infrastructure given, as uh, Dr. Lochana said, then there must be certain economic activity which, which, which could be uh, looked at from the point of view of what you what you were promoting that to do value addition at the point of production and uh, which is like say agricultural products that's what I I think what you meant by that and uh, then you will get this uh, this particular center or a small uh, city or a small township um, getting economic strength as well uh, so can you uh, elaborate on this uh, what you are thinking professor Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I think you, uh, you e explained exactly what I was thinking of, uh, but I think we can go a step further than that. Yes, value addition of produce of an area should benefit that particular area and not uh, another area which, which utilizes it or takes it over and adds value and then sells it at that point. Now, the basic concept, and pardon me for oversimplifying a very complex issue here, Chair, uh, if, you, if you take, say, the example of, say, our cinnamon. Now, our cinnamon is sold in bulk, and you know that our cinnamon is the best, probably one of the best uh, quality cinnamon that you get in the world because the other cinnamons that producers in China are acacias and various other things which are sometimes toxic. Now, our cinnamon is taken uh, from the producer in the rural areas, brought to Colombo, bundled, and then auctioned and sold and taken out. Now, the value addition to that happens outside because all of you who have gone abroad and bought, tried to buy a packet of cinnamon powder you know what you are pay paying for that. And it's about 20 to 40 times more than what that producer gets. So the point that I'm trying to make here is, why can't we do that value addition at the point of production? Now, if you can 
think in those terms and go into a system where the producer is enabled and given the facilities, uh, given the funds, given the necessary uh, incentives like tax incentives and various things. And if you can produce that and packet it at the point of production, and that's what I mean by value addition, and then send it out or export it. Now this would bring funds and uh, the economy to that particular area where it is produced. Now, if you can do that, and I'm, again I say I'm simplifying a complex problem, if you can do that, you will find that that local authority where this is produced gets a certain income, maybe rates or taxes or whatever it is. And the people in that area are also given employment. Now, once you give employment to the people of that area, they also spend within that particular area. So, the basic principle that I'm trying to uh, get at Cha is that if you can improve the economy of a particular area, a local authority, then that local authority can generate sufficient funds for development of that area. Now, at the moment, if, say, if you take a, a village or some uh, town, if we want to develop something, usually it happens that the ADB or the World Bank or someone has to give a loan and you know, start development projects there. That is because the local authorities don't have the funds. And whatever funds that are generated there are taken by the central government. Now, this is a very simplified way of putting it. And I can give, Cinnamon is just one of the examples, I can give you an example. And um, Chad, this is already beginning to happen. It's nothing new. It's happening in a small scale that uh, is maybe we don't realize. Now let me give you an example of that. Take our jaggery. If you go back 10, 15 years, our jaggery was made into a polka tan, then it was wrapped up uh, in a candacole or something and then brought and sold. Now can you export that? No. But now, Someone has started packeting and uh, packeting this into cubes and uh, labeling it and made it exportable. Now that is what I mean by value addition. Now the point I'm trying to make here is don't do that value addition elsewhere. L promote that ruler the area where they are producing this to do the value addition. Now I'll give you another example, which uh, probably lots of you are not aware of, which has been going on for a number of years, years and years, and you realize how much we are losing on this. Our uh, eastern coastal areas in the bottom of the sea is covered with ilmenite. Now ilmenite is harvested and brought to the land. It's the black sand that you see when you go to the beach. It's brought in. Uh, and harvested, and if you go during the correct seasons, the monsoonal seasons in the eastern coast, you see about half inch thickness of black sand deposited there. That's all ilmenite. Now that is brought in and then sold. And it's not brought into Colombo even immediately. It's taken off from Trincomalee Harbor and it's sold out. And I think China is one of the biggest buyers. Now apparently this ilmenite that we have here is 51% pure. Ilmenite compared to some of the other ilmenite that you produce. Now, what do the exporters do that? They, what do they do with it? They take it out and they convert it to uh, titanium dioxide, which is a white powder which we use for whitening of our walls and so on. So we buy it back from them. Then also, titanium dioxide is the base product for producing titanium. Now, if you compare the prices, which I have done some long time ago when I went and discovered this, you will find that the value addition that takes place for that product <coughs> is about 200 times. So what does Sri Lanka get out of it? What does the place like, you know, the coastal regions where they harvest this or collect this get out of it? They get pittance. So, 
our environment is being sold, our uh, labor is being, you know, not used to the maximum, and at the same time, the areas where they should be making money out of this is getting pittance and therefore, coming back to the topic of urban development and urban design, they, those areas do not have the funds to develop their own towns and villages. This is how I got around to it, I mean, to tie it up with the theme of urban design and rural development that you're talking about. Uh, this is an indirect way of saying that if we can uh, produce, uh, value add to our produce, and that's the term that you use, which is the term that I'm also using and trying to promote, if we can add value to the products uh, in that same area, then I'm saying that those areas will benefit, and that will be the beginning of the rural development and the township development of those areas. This is, Mr. Chairman, in confusion, is happening to our tea, rubber, coconut, and it has been happening to all the other products. There are so much of other agricultural products which are being wasted and not even utilized, which can be tinned and exported, but our, our country does not utilize them. So there is a vast potential for rural development. And whatever produce, take the rice even, we are buying the rice from our rural areas and bring it to Colombo, but the, uh, the rice molar hardly gets anything. The molar is making money, but the farmer hardly gets anything. So, but it's packeted somewhere else and sold and mass produced, uh, sold somewhere else. So, uh, let me conclude because I have taken no more than my three minutes. Uh, Mr. Chair, what you said was correct. It's a question of value adding a pro to, a, a, to the produce of your own area for the benefit of that area. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I think that's what one of the points that we could record as uh, concluding things in our discussion. Yes. Thank you, Professor. Next, architect Harshan De Silva is the current chairman of the Urban Development Authority and presented the topic, the UDA's point of view on the way forward, where he outlines a unique national strategy termed Saubagi Dakma to be executed in the next five years to include creating four multinational cities, connecting cities, coastal cities, cluster cities, and promote specialized zones for development, for example, Port City, Hambantota, etc and improvements to infrastructure and development system and transportation system is promoted to bring about equity not only in the cities but also in the suburb and the rural areas. Unfortunately, architect Harshan couldn't attend this session. Yeah, uh, Harshan is uh, one of our members, so uh, I think we can always in uh, touch with him. Uh, unfortunately, he not been able to come today. Uh, but uh, he is on the hot, hot seat. I think uh, uh, it would have been nicer if he had been here. But however, um, I think uh, say what his uh, presentation was basically highlighting uh, what is the present context and what are the things that they are planning to do. So I think we all could uh, listen to that and see and then see whether uh, whatever we are deliberating here. Uh, is applicable or whether there will be changes required or whether uh, we can inform uh, with, I think SLA could discuss this with uh, Harshan on personal basis and then um, take our message to him. Uh, yeah, thank you. We'll go with uh, architect Pali. Our next panelist, architect planner conservator, Pali Vijayaratna, is the managing director of Environmental Planning Services Private Limited and shared his views on the topic, the explanation of social impact assessment in urban regeneration schemes, a new vision for planning and evaluating options for city development. He calls for a comprehensive impact assessment criteria before approving a medium or large scale project to access the impact of the development to the community and a new vision for planning and evaluating should include economic prosperity, environmental quality, social equity and cultural heritage. Town of city centre developments cannot be designed by the town of spatial planners without any architects or urban designers in the team. 
Tower of City that are here, historic importance, cannot be designed without the inputs of conservation architect in attendance. Otherwise, it will be like using a square peg in a round hole or a single equivalent goes. Accidentally, for the project to be successfully implemented, they should have the following ingredients. Be people-centric rather than political centric Include specific ways and means of uplifting the living standards of the local communities and the separate members of the public. Include the economics and the proposed development plans. A method statement of the plan implementation. Monitoring process of the plan implementation and after. Details of stakeholders. Both public and private sector participation in the process at all stages. Be firm in the monitoring process and not allow the developers to fool the law and get away with nominal fines. The fines should exceed the profit margins they would get from total development as a means of discourage. Discourage the professionals from aiding and abetting such antisocial activities of the developers. Introduce the submission of social impact assessment reports in all major development projects, including high rise developments within the built up area. Therefore, before granting approvals, alternately, the developer should be called upon to pay a percentage of the total project to the planning authority to carry out such an assessment. This is similar to the archaeological impact assessment that is being carried out by the they levy a 1% of the total cost of the project and appoint a team led by an archaeologist from our state to carry out the assessment report. In conclusion, may I take this opportunity for the sake of sustainability and social justice, appeal to the planning authorities to reconsider the use of zoning as a tool of the development controls of the future. Instead, I would I would like to direct your attention to the schemes adopted in Queensland, Australia. There, they introduced new, de new development controls in such a way that they retain areas for agriculture and not continually subdivide and contain growth. They have introduced a new act with strict conditions in line with the philosophy of sustainability and good environmental practices. It protects biodiversity and conservation values more than it did earlier. It prohibits nothing as long as the development conforms to the set environmental guidelines and physical and social infrastructure requirements. In theory, they say that developers can even put a nuclear power plant in Port Douglas is a thickly populated area, provided they can prove that it does not create noise or environmental pollution. Let me conclude in appealing to the authorities to follow up your model development plans with a monitoring and implementation program that is people friendly. Seek cooperation from your friends and colleagues in the professions locally rather than run to the foreigners for advice. It is more cost effective and sustainable because we know our country better than all the foreigners put together and hence we are more qualified to implement the four pillars of sustainability and the World Bank guidelines. In addition, please do not treat some developers as more equal than others, that is being antisocial and also not being professional. I appeal to the professional institutes to start a dialogue with government and authorities on the ways and means of giving them a hand to develop the country. In a social and economical or environmentally acceptable form, help them to get the best of professional inputs without political or other favoritism. 
and open the doors to all members rather than a favored few. I appeal to fellow architects that unlike the other oaths, you have taken on material ideas such as obligations to other colleagues or to your clients. Your social responsibility should come from your heart. It is an obligation you have to not only the present generation but to the future ones too. In addition, they should prove to the country their concerns and commitment for all four pillars of sustainability as described in the Blood Convention Report. Last but not the least, I appeal to the professionals in this country that they practice the culture they are born to and that is to respect the elders. Please practice this principle when interventions and new development proposals are being considered in historic areas. The neighborhood settings should be given priority over the other factors, even though development should in effect, reflect the spirit of age and spiritual time. Meaning the thoughts, materials, values and styles shall reflect the 21st century, but the new infield developments should not depict the arrogance of modernism, overriding the historic importance of the city. After all, as John Ruskin, the famous architect, philosopher, social thinker and art critic, the 19th century, he wrote in his book, Seven Maps of Architecture, that these old buildings and monuments belong partly to those who built them in the past and partly to the yet unborn future mankind. We are only caretakers and have no right to obliterate or vandalize them. Thank you. Uh. Thank you, architect uh, Pali, for your presentation. Um, say, I will directly uh, get into the questions. You have uh, touched a lot of things, particularly it is um, uh, particularly uh, evaluation of um, uh, planning vision on economic prosperity, environmental quality, social equity, and cultural heritage is a, is a new thinking that uh, comes into our context. Uh, because uh, our environmental assessments are not touching some of these uh, areas. And you uh, also uh, stated in your uh, presentation that cultural identity must be uh, also as much as possible to be uh, preserved. Uh, my uh, two questions that I would like to ask at once. Uh, one is that, say, why do you think this cultural identity in the uh, rapid uh, globalization context, how much it will be sort of, uh, sorry? Yeah, say I have uh, say two questions. One is uh, uh, say, how do you look at the cultural identity in a, a rapidly urbanizing, uh, globalizing context? That is one, <clears throat> because uh, we are also catching up with globalization and some of the cultural identities might be losing in that sense. Then the second one is the evaluation of process of the equity process that you are of uh, social and cultural heritage. Uh, can you explain that more? Yeah. Mr. Chairman, two things. One is, uh, in the first place, I would like to classify architecture as a social science coupled with uh, anthropology and archaeology and economics and all the other similar subjects. Unless, of course, we classify architecture as a pile of bricks and mortar or uh, along with a few pipes and a few wires and a couple of sheets, metal sheets. So since we are tackling this on a social basis, we'll have to consider it as a social science, whereas every person has a stake, is a stakeholder in these developments. So 
once we have taken the reem, then we have to make sure that in our planning and evaluation process, everybody becomes a stakeholder, and more so the architects. Because in the 90s and the 20s, this tradition was there, and I think uh, Lochi and Lal and all the others would vouch for it, that both UD and NPPD call for private sector architects to come into their teams and work with them. But somewhere along the line, that tradition went away. And now they have, they're doing it on their own with no inputs from everybody else, but they would sometimes prefer to get the foreigners to come in and tell, give them that input. Now, what is the social impact of th that they know of, of a Sri Lankan community? Now, this is a question we need to ask in this. Then also, we can, I'll bring out a couple of examples of this. One is the recent Kurunagal incident. Everybody knows about it. But how many people have gone in and looked at the website to see the Kurunagal development plan? According to that development plan, that famous or infamous building is not even listed, not even mentioned in that development plan. And not only that, that development, produce, in producing that development plan, there were no architects, no urban designers. And you are developing a town center. Then there are no stakeholder meetings except the government departments being discussed with. Now, is that a right solution? And they have only identified a few historic buildings or in Kurnagala. And one of them is being earmarked to be a 50-roomed uh, luxury hotel. So I wonder how that historic building will fit into that luxury hotel. You see, now these are the issues that are coming up when there is no architect's role coming into it, an architect, particularly a local architect. So this is why I feel that we have a role to play in this, and that role has to be taken seriously. Individuals can't fight this case, but the institute can. And it's something that the institute should call for it and go back. I know now our present chairman, when he was working, he roped us all in to his their departmental projects. So he can now put a different hat on and go back and tell them <laughs> to turn the history back. But then also, I talked about the need for a cultural assessment report. Now all this time, we have an archeological impact assessment and an environmental impact assessment reports for projects, but not a sociocultural impact assessment. Now, recently one was done for the port city. And I had the privilege to be a member of that thing. This is how I knew about it. But one of the things that I insisted at that time was don't take the port city on its own. But with blinkers on, but incorporate Colombo Fort into it. And this was accepted even by the ministry, thank God for that. So we did an analysis of both these. And unfortunately, even then we looked at the EIA as well, and we found that two archaeological sites that was just outside the Galboka Lighthouse, had been buried in the sand. 
archaeology department was called in to make an assessment on it. And they said, well, it is not 100 years old. Therefore, they took the measurements and they buried it. But under UDA law, because this is an area that is classified as a historic zone under the UDA law, and they had the right to do, uh, list it and protect it, but they didn't, and they were not summoned, and this was not even called for. And in that EIA report also, there was no architectural inputs into it. It was purely an engineering input. And another thing that we realized in it was, they were taking, from the national grid to the power, they were taking water from the main systems here. And we don't have enough water, we don't have enough power in the for us. Where do we get this from then? Whereas they sit on three natural resources there. They could have set us an example on how to do it. Because their whole mission is to make it a world-class city to be integrated into the Sri Lankan culture. So it's taking in Sri Lankan culture, but what they're doing is taxing us and not, and destroying our culture rather than uh, saving it for us. Even the popular culture, has a, there's a question mark in even our popular culture being promoted. Because they have their own cultural activities coming in there. They're talking about tourism for the port city. But if you go in for the statistics of the World Tourism Organization, they talk about 40% of world tourists go in for cultural tourism and historic tourism. So that is something that we can explore within the Colombo Fort area. And that needs to be taken into account. So why is the UDA is promoting UDA and the government and everybody else is promoting the port city? There must be immediate plans for the development of Colombo Fort. And that is something that we as an institute, a professional institute or responsibility can take it out. And we can get our own members to come in. This is why I made that appeal, that the institute should take the lead role in this to do that and bring, bring our culture into that area rather than getting an imported culture into it. Does, my, does I answer your question? Thank you, yes. <laughs> um, I think what, um, uh, what uh, yes, there is a, say, professional institute to play a role in this, yeah. definitely, with, uh, say, planning as well as uh, architecture and all those institutes. Uh, so, uh, shall we move on because we are eating into time a lot. Uh, yeah, next. Thank you, Architect Pali. Uh, Architect Anura Ratnavibhushana, Honorary Fellow of the SLIA, lent his expertise and ideas on the topic of conservation development of pristine landscapes, where he outlines a preamble to regulations and recommends to emphasize the object and spirit to allow reasonable development while conserving the spiritual splendor, splendor and cultural uh, legacy to future Lankans. Unfortunately, Architect Ratnavibhushana was not able to join us today. Uh, in the speech, uh, he had made a very, uh, say his paper, um, very interesting uh, points. And he raised uh, certain um, answers also. He, he, he proposes certain answers how we could actually get into the rural sector and uh, development and uh, say those needs to be examined and then uh, discussed. Further, so with that note, we will get on with uh, uh, Vidya Jyoti Ashley Divorce's uh, lecture. Thank you, sir. Vidya Jyoti Architect Ashley Divorce, Honorary Fellow of the SLIA. Uh, he promotes the need to create public spaces for vibrant and healthy community to promote successful, healthy livelihoods. The need to create places for people is challenged by unplanned urban growth and calls for a local solution for local problems. Unfortunately, Architect DeVos couldn't be present for today's session as well. 
please? Yeah, uh, Architect Devo's uh, presentation, I think, uh, it, it touched lots of area and, uh, and uh, say, uh, naturally he is also uh, bringing up certain points like high rise and when you build a high rise, where is equity or where is equality in uh, say social justice for the person who is at the ground level. So that's one of the basic points that he's uh, talking about. At one point I thought that he's against or he's not talking of high rise but some of the examples that he cited from outside Sri Lanka uh, shows that what he is trying to say is perhaps if it is inevitable, uh, let's have it, but then uh, we have to consider the ground and the scale and at what proportions that we could do, whether we could do without that as well. So there is lots of points that uh, is there, so I will leave uh, that also at that point and uh, I think he, he is also into mostly that believes and he uh, proposes that uh, we can achieve high density with low rise development. So that is, that, that brings in uh, another aspect into this. Uh, yeah, we'll go with Dr. Right. Janaka. Thank you, sir. Our next panelist, architect Dr. Janaka Vijay Sundara, is a lecturer at the University of Moratua and principal architect at Design Plan Associates, and presented the topic, Evidence-Based Research for Urban Design in Sri Lanka and Other Developing Countries, a Comparative Analysis. He emphasizes the importance of the usage of detailed research in obtaining correct strata in decision-making in city development. Therefore, Basically, they identified uh, five to six location, locations, and uh, these rhythms were studied throughout the day, uh, stationing at different uh, locations each of the time, uh, observing people as well as the uh, talking to people, uh, as well as observing the vehicle uh, arrangements there. Uh, and uh, also various activities taken place uh, within within this place. Uh, so it is. Uh, we also look at that uh, how and most visited places in coal. So we took local residents, local visitors, as well as tourists, foreign tourists. Uh, so we found lot of different answers, uh, some are telling, uh, particularly local residents are a little bit uh, sort of reacting in different way. So the visitors, both foreigners and local, reacting uh, much similar way. And also we uh, done with mind maps to understand how people reimagine the place or uh, the uh, most uh, memorable places and so on. So we get uh, results out of them. Then, um, so we actually synthesized all these uh, data that we obtained through the rhythm analysis, and then uh, finally came up into a, a kind of a common uh, understanding of the vision for the development in terms of various aspects uh, that we identified. Uh, which may be important for the development of the course. So basically, um, it is final reflections were that um, so these uh, fourth dimension that is about the time and the uh, time also to be uh, utilized or used uh, and uh, so. Uh, so so uh, this actually uh, to be, uh, but I have just uh, brief uh, about the uh, the uh, use of uh, rhythm analysis to obtain the data for the future development. So um, this is something that I would like to share with you uh, that uh, our decisions strictly to be based on the sound and uh, very uh, much uh, uh, sensitive data and we must come up with 
the, the new methodology is ways of obtaining these data and analyzing uh, to reflect uh, what we decide on people is more appropriate and more correct and fair for them. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Say we, we, we were uh, evidence-based research is uh, what we were focusing with uh, Dr. Jahanaka. Um, and I just uh, thought that we have, uh, as I said in the beginning also, um, say there is a need for us to have our theoretical works and then have checked it in our grounds, uh, what are the evidence that we have and what are the things that we change, we should, whether we should change our parameters of uh, values, um, say, can we adapt uh, them in future? Um, what do you think, uh, say, what do you think of we developing uh, our own parameters of uh, urban assessment as well as certain design criteria uh, proposals um, based on our own assessments or our own research and development, which is very uh, little that we have done in our country. Uh, so in that context, um, that you uh, say you look at this evidence-based research and how much it will be helpful to uh, redefine some of the theories that we have learned in, in from the West or uh, certain scholars. That is one. Then uh, number two, you have uh, discussed in detail one of the examples of uh, changes in uh, slave island uh, proves some uh, theories what uh, Dr. Seneca was talking about, say how uh, this uh, equity or inequality uh, came into B and occupy the uh, say physical space. Uh, can you explain those two? Number one is the uh, say what are the <clears throat> uh, say uh, do you think that say research of original research in here uh, deriving new parameters will help us to develop ourselves? That number two is uh, your experience with the slave island that you have uh, spoke about. Uh, Thank you very much, Nava. Um, I just want to highlight in my presentation uh, one of the factors, it's a central to the discussion here, that how much uh, we are uh, concerning about the social inclusion, social space in our development projects, and then how our research-based findings can focus uh, quite sensitively, accurate, uh, to our programs. So um, the reason that I thought about that is we know that in the development of some areas in Colombo, especially elsewhere as well, other cities as well, that uh, these developments are taken place in such a way that completely the city, uh, what is used to be uh, continued, uh, has been uh, changed uh, to a great extent. If you look at the central core area that is in around fort as well as Goldface area, that the new buildings coming up there is completely uh, distracting or discontinuing with the, what is happening in the streets and public spaces, including the Bere lakefront as well as the seafront. Secondly, another example that I presented this that the road development, street developments happening in and around Colombo. The area where I live, I see that the one most recent street widening project or the street improvement project, where there's no social space, there's no space for people to walk after the road is built, after the road is widened. Now you have only the drainage covers on top. You can walk just very, you know, in a minimum uh, facilities. As well as there's no any separation from the road or the vehicle area to the public space where people walk. It's same level. Uh, normally should have a protective 
kind of uh, barrier or a kind of level difference. So, um, in fact, like these are the minimum standards that we were expecting, right? The privacy, uh, not the privacy, the, 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 the safety and the comfort. So, um, currently, we are actually conducting a research at the Morotu University Department of uh, Architecture, Center for Cities, where we won a research grant from the World Bank to work on the uh, assessment criteria, assessment model, uh, to check whether the public space, all the public spaces, including streets, playgrounds, uh, nature areas, public squares, plazas, and so on, whether they are confirming to the minimum standards of uh, the safety and the comfort. So it has been started uh, last year. It is continuing. We have two more years to complete. So there's a team working on that for uh, research, uh, uh, the PhD uh, research students working with us. And uh, so that would be something that we are trying to see that whether these current international standards or standards set in South Asian region, so we'll be looking at all the, all the cities, all the places, and see that whether we can accept them into our situation or whether there are any variations, any modifications, alterations to be required for those standards uh, in order to uh, satisfy with our requirements that public space, uh, comfort, and the safety. Uh, that's one of the initiations. So I hope that uh, we will be able to find uh, some new way of looking into that with new standards, uh, because we know that our society is different, our cultural uh, setting is different. Uh, so people accept public spaces in different ways. Uh, than the Western world. So therefore, whatever offered, or whatever we learned uh, from those theories, uh, there, there will be a certain, it's not something that we want to build a new theory, but you know, it's, it's a kind of retesting that certain aspect, certain uh, theoretical uh, settings, as well as the principles uh, conforming to our standards. So, uh, that uh, I think my presentation finally I presented that some of the works that our masters of urban design students did uh, I think I see some of them are here uh, and uh, that is in Goldfort where we use the uh, the theoretical approach of Henry Lifferbrow its uh, social space uh, to uh, going into a much uh, detailed surveys uh, as given in these uh, approaches and, and check uh, how the goal fort is working for that and see that what are the key changes that you need to do or key, uh, key improvements that you have to do uh, in terms of the movement uh, use uh, and also the activity patterns and so on. So um, th that's a kind of you know, something that we try to apply uh, certain uh, theoretical uh, models or the approaches into a local situation, uh, bridging with the locational or contextual uh, settings. Uh. And surely we will be able to get certain uh, results from that, uh, Doctor. Yes. Thank you, Doctor.